Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. Today's topic is teaching and learning excellence. Joining me in this conversation is Sensei Joe Tambu. Before we start, I want to share something I'm very excited to announce, and that is my Spirit Aikido online program now has over 200 videos in the library. In the most recent video set, I've released a series on the self-defense entry for Aikido practitioners. These entries use movements which every Aikido practitioner is familiar with. What I share in these videos is a way to apply them in a way that's very useful for self-defense. If you'd like to support the show, please consider subscribing to this online program. There's a lot of content I know you'll enjoy. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. I'd like to welcome back Joe Tambu Sensei to the podcast. We're going to have a great conversation today. Um, welcome back, Sensei, and uh, great to have you on again. Thank you, and Joe is fine. Joe, excellent. Uh, the topic today is going to be, and I'm still figuring out the best way of conveying this, is how do you convey excellence both from uh, an instructor who wants to bring the most out of his student as well as you are a student and you want to really fill in and build yourself in, into having an excellent skill set. Um, so I want to cover this kind of from both angles. So this may be ambitious to do in one discussion. Because uh, there's- say, How much time do we have? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but there, there's definitely, I think, a magic relationship part when both parties are doing what they need to do to bring out the most in the student. And that is, uh, the intent from the instructor, as well as the intent from the student. Um, so maybe we could start from the instructor part. If you are an instructor, I'd like your views on how you bring the most out of your students to get them to fulfill their potential. Um, I think whatever we do has to have the student in mind, mm -hmm. the subject matter in mind, but also where I am in that point in my life. So going back, my way of, of teaching was really hardcore. I was, I was a Nazi. Mm -hmm. uh, I push, I kick, I, 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 you know, I do all kinds of things to get the best out of my students. And things had to be, you got to get it right now. You got to get it correct now. You got to get it correct now. And the students I had back then uh, liked that. And that was naturally me. Mm. I've changed. That's no longer me. And sometimes I wish I hadn't changed. But for me to do that now is not natural. So, so have you found a better way, a way that works I more efficiently? I think, I think maybe I'm more patient now. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking perhaps if they don't get it today, they'll get it tomorrow. Whereas in the past, get it right now. Cor get it correct now. Do it correctly now. So I've, I've changed, maybe not for the better, but I cannot do what is unnatural for me. Sure. I cannot teach in a way that's unnatural for me. So that's from my perspective, firstly. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, then, you know, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I think as teachers, we, the first mistake we make is that and then I, I do this, I don't know how not to do this. And it's especially so in Aikido. A lot of the teachers and anyone you care to name who is good went through the hard yards mm -hmm. and then discover a softer way, uh, a more fluid way of doing things. And then we try and teach that softer and fluid way to our current students. Whereas we should let them do the hard yards. I agree. We need to let them let them walk that hard path. We need to let them get beaten up a little bit like we did. Uh, mind you, litigation now is, you know, uh, but uh, you, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. we, we, we try and make those shortcuts for them. And I think your post on Facebook, what was it? There's no shortcuts or yeah, do the work because the, it's the, uh, I forget exactly how I put it. It was very much a right off the top of my head thing. Of oh, it was, it was the, the, yeah. the only real shortcut is realizing there are no shortcuts. Perfect. Yeah. 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 But uh, then as teachers, we, we try and do that for our students because we think 
our job is to, if it took us 15 years, we should try and get someone doing it in five. Mm -hmm. But there's something lost in that. In, in, so in, in the Yoshinkan system, uh, Yoshin is to build your spirit. Not just teach good immaculate technique, it's to build your spirit. And how do you build one spirit? Push the envelope. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that comes, you know, being treated harshly. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, I think that first mistake we make is we, we try and shortcut our students. Sure. And we got to learn what you said and but there's no shortcut. Yeah. Right. You know, and I have found that there are uh, the technology of, of teaching, there, there are always refinements to not waste training time. And, and there are not to say that it's pursuing a shortcut, but you do want to pursue the most direct line from point A to your destination and not take circuitous winding roads and, and offshoot paths uh, to find where you, it is you want to go. And, uh, but I think that within there, the idea that the teacher is looking to, to help guide the student along the most, if, most direct path to where they want to go is an important thing for the instructor. On the student side, it should be, I don't care how long it takes along that direct path. I, it's not like I need to be there by Friday. I can, you know, build upon what I'm doing this week and I'm going to build upon what I do this week, next week, and build upon that later. And not to be, you know, drumming the fingers, kind of go, when am I going to, when am I going to be good, you know, and, and to be impatient. Let, let me uh, quote uh, Inoue Sensei, <clears throat> one of his stories. He said, um, if you take a lift inside a mountain from the bottom to the top, you see the view when you get in the lift and you see the view from the top. But if you're walking up the mountain, you enjoy the view at every different step. Sure. It's a different view, different mm -hmm. experience. Yep. So he said, don't be in a hurry to get from A to B. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy right. the walk. Yeah. Yep. You know, and I found too that, that and I must say that I've never been kind of the drill sergeant type instructor. Uh, although in my exuberance to try to try to convey what I've learned to others, I have fallen into the trap many times of flooding a student, trying to give them too much too quickly. And, and the patients that I learned, similar to the patients you learned, I think the lesson was a little different, but the overall goal was the same. I've, I realized that students are only ready to absorb when they get to a certain point. If you give them tips or information or instruction that they're not ready to absorb, it will just, it'll just pass right over them. But if you're there at the right time and you can see it and be there with just what they need to, to learn next, then you can, that's when the growth really, you can see it. So there's a, I, I see an issue now with uh, a lot of teachers on the seminar circuit. Mm -hmm. Me included, right? Um, we, we try and give people too much and we try and overly teach because we don't, we see them once a year or something uh, in my dojo, you know, it's different, but when we're on a seminar, we try and explain a lot. We try and teach too much. And I think that anything worth learning has to be learned, cannot be taught. And mm -hmm. I think Aikido is a, an art form that. I can open the door, but you know, I cannot teach you. You have to learn it. So right. no matter how many times I tell you this is the way it should be, and I tell you all these nice, I really got to give you time to, to learn it. Mm -hmm. And and you got to be able to uh, work it out yourself and and uh, yeah, things like that. And and instead we we just you know, we, we try and drill people and, and explain things to the nth degree. Sure. It, it, can't, it can't be taught. It has to be learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing that, to me, I like having my students feel it when they can feel the, how it, a technique or how, how something goes. And that's why I like getting them to do reps more than I like just sitting and giving them a description or an oration. I mean, that's part of it. Because I like them to understand why, like, why are you doing what I've just shown you to do? Like, what are the important things you should be looking for to try to 
get them closer to that feel. But the ultimate goal is them being able to feel that smooth connection and how they manage their, their own movement with Uke's movement, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I've had I've, people ask me like, well, what do I do if I get to a, a, a class or something with an instructor I don't like? Should I, go to, should I go to an Aikido class with an instructor I don't get along with or I don't care for? And I, and I always tell them like, you'll learn more, much more from your uke than you will learn from the guy or the woman leading the class. Like that's where the real learning is done when you can feel that exchange from uke to nage, whether in whichever side you're on, you're gonna learn. And uh, you know, that's more important than who's, who's actually guiding the class. And, I mean, and that's, I might be, yeah. I might be digressing a little bit, but sure. it, it's been one of my missions in life to to change people's mindset mm -hmm. and not think I'm going to the dojo to learn Aikido. Mm. I'm going to the dojo to train Aikido. I want people to come to the dojo to do Aikido. Mm -hmm. So whether Tristan's teaching or Joe's teaching or, or Jimmy's teaching, it don't matter. I'm going to the dojo to do. I go three times a, a week. And that's my schedule. I will go three times a week, five times a week. That's my schedule. It's part of my life. I do. So it, it's irrespective of who's teaching. I'm there to do, mm -hmm. not to learn. Sure. And I, th I think the old Japanese system, you know, we, you put your money on the table and you say, um, can I enter the dojo? If you teach, it, the, the, the feeling was re really, can I enter the dojo? If I got taught, that was a bonus. Here, uh, in Western countries, you put your money on the counter, hands on your hips, and you say, teach me now. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they say there's two kinds of people who come to the dojo, people who want to learn and people who want to be taught. I like that. That's true. And, and, and you and I know which ones are going to excel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, I would so identify you know, those people as the ones who have the most open mind. And you can spot them from a mile away. The ones that, that they, they not only come in and say, here's what I'm interested in doing, but you can tell that they, they want to absorb and they want to examine and not just emulate. Um, I think the, the, like you identified the people who want to just want to be taught, want to go through motions and try to you know, kind of copy the motion. And you can tell that they're, their mind really isn't engaged, but their body is kind of trying to just follow along. And yeah. I've, those people I've found difficult to reach. Um, and, and those are the kind of people who, if the class starts at six o'clock, they're there at six o'clock and they leave at seven. Right. Yep. They're in and out. Yep. Yeah. The ones who want to learn, you literally have to kick them off the mat at nine o'clock when you want to go <laughs> Right. Yep. But the, Someone asked a friend of mine who teaches BJJ, you know, uh, how do you get good? He said, be the last to leave. Mm -hmm. be, no, he said, be the last one. Mm -hmm. Be the last one. <clears throat> and, uh, or the last one left. And everyone thought in terms of you survive and you're, you're there, you know, right. at the end. And he, he was like, no, that's one aspect. But the other aspect is train and, and be the, get kicked off the mat. Mm-hmm. Be the last to leave because it's in that after class that's when you make the techniques your own. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, isn't that what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think having to switch it around and look at this from the student perspective, if you look at, and you know, mindset is about everything. Your, your mindset sets the stage for whether it's self-defense or you're learning something or you're in a relationship. If your mindset is not focused correctly, either it's too broad a focus, too narrow focus, focused on the wrong thing, you're just going to miss the mark. And, and coming in and thinking, like you said, the hand on the hips, okay, teach me, your mind is not fully engaged because the, the student really provides the, the engine and the instructor steers the car where it's supposed to go. But without that engine in there, moving forward, moving the car forward, that's, that will inhibit this, the progress. 
Um, you know, and I've had the pleasure of, of having students that were very easy to teach because they, they're, they would come in, you know, and be ready right away when class was started, like, let's go. That engine was, was revved up and ready to go. And they just needed a little bit of guidance. And then there've been others that have been, all right, I need to kind of get you to rev your engine a little bit to kind of get into the, not just the instruction and not just copy along, but how to start making this training your own because it is every student's training is their own. I'll tell you a story. Um, I had this visitor come out from England and he was, he was a strong boy. He was strong and he would resist every technique and, you know, and I got to a point one day when I just got really angry and I, I smashed him. And it wasn't pretty. It wasn't all technique. A lot of it was ego, anger, whatever. And I just smashed him. And I did it a few times. I finished the class. I walked off. And as I walked off, one of the junior instructors, he was in his early 20s. Um, he was knee down back then. He called everyone together and he said, if you ask, does this work once or twice? That's fine. In, in, your in your manner as you can, if you ask, does this work once or twice, that's fine. But if you're asking that every day, you need to find another dojo. After you ask that once or twice, then your question should change to, how is this working? And, and if you think about it, it was very wise from someone so young. That is very insightful. And, and if you think about it, I can't show this in body language, but this is me thinking, does this work? This is me thinking, how does this work? Because I'm trying to feel it. So I go from bunched up shoulders to hips down, elbows in, thinking, I want to feel how this is working. So that change in mindset also is a physical change. It and, is. And, and it, it's, it's really, you know, by all means, ask, does this work? By all means. But if you're continuously asking that, you need to find another place. Okay. Right. And that's one of those mindset uh, indicators of the, well, but what if I do this other thing? And, you know, my, my patent answer generally is, okay, well, we can study that at another moment. Right now we're working on this particular thing, you know, but it's easy to kind of play the, the, uh, the shell game, jumping around from one thing to the other. And, uh, you know, I, it's one thing for brand new people to do that. I, you know, you kind of expect it. They're, they're curious, their minds are, uh, eager to just jump into everything. Uh, but it's such a big um, bundle of things to study. You, you can only do one at a time. You know, you, you, you can't study it all at once. It's, it's not possible, in my opinion, to, to separate the man from the art. Mm -hmm. And as a friend of mine, an artist said, if you're seeing the technique, you're not seeing the artist. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear of teachers who on the seminar circuit and uh, well, put, put it this way, I, I go to the Ukraine a lot. Okay. And there's some big boys there. Big oh, yeah. Boys. And they're always asking me, uh, what happens if someone does this? What happens if someone grabs you? What happens if someone chokes you, throws a kick, throws a punch, whatever? And my first response is, can you fall? And if they say yes, I said, okay, come up. And do what you want to do. And, and they would do it. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I have absolutely no idea, but I am going to do something or they're going to knock me out. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no two ways about it. So sometimes someone will say, you know, uh, what happens if someone chokes you? And I'm sometimes in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, you know, front choke and they just spin me around because I'm small and just get me in a back choke, rear choke. And because I want to show what to do, I have to let them put me in that position. There's no plans, nothing. I will do what I do. If it means kicking them in the groin and then doing something, I do that. But then I say, that's what I do, but we're not going to practice that today. So, but what, what I need to do is show them that I can do it. And then they believe in what I have to offer. Too sure. so many Aikido teachers don't do that. They stand there and say, no, you shouldn't grab like this. You shouldn't do this. Right. And that, that's where... Aikido just falls apart. I've had I've heard of one teacher who said, 
uh, I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> so what's he going to do? Go and look at YouTube or something or think right. about it? You have to, even if you're not going to teach the technique, people need to believe that you can at least do something. Sure. Well, you know, I, I and I equate this to the, to like a guitar player, for example, and they say, okay, well, let's, we're going to play a rhythm and you're going to play a lead. And they'll go, okay. And then ask him, well, what are you going to play? How, what notes exactly are you going to play? And he said, I don't know. I'm going to just feel the music and play what I feel like playing. And, and that's when you described it, I very much equated it to that. Yeah. Um, where it's a, you're kind of riding the ride, not pre-planning what, what's going to happen. Um, and I think what so, you've described is that instructors that are, that are so steeped into the choreography that that's all they know. Um, and, and, and that's okay for a junior level. Mm -hmm. But when you get someone who's like a six, seven, eighth done, you can't come up in a demonstration and just do basics. Right. At that level, people want to see where the basics have taken you. Mm -hmm. You can do basics, but then you need to show that where that's helped you move on. Right. Uh, people don't do that. They still get up and do A, B, C, D, E. Sure. And a lot of martial arts are stuck in that. Mm -hmm. uh, someone once said to me, um, if you give a group of prisoners a key, some of them will use it to escape. And others would put it on the wall and pray to it. <laughs> oh, that's a good image. And and the basics are that key mm -hmm. for us to to you know to to progress. Instead, sure. we we just get bogged down in in that. And and the basics become an, a means to an end and and a, a be all and end all. And it's not what it's meant to be. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I you know I've really thought about well, why exactly is that. And I think for one thing, it's easy to go through those kata drills and through, through those fundamentals. And I mean, I'm a huge fan of fundamentals. I, you, the simple direct is what I train the most because that's the foundation I want all my students to have. And I want to have myself, um, but you can't be stuck there. It has to build to the next thing, which is to start putting those notes together into making that music that, that comes from the heart, not comes from the sheet, you know, the, the plan. And, and I think that that's, you know, when I've heard uh, people that teach in the self-defense realm and the combatives realm, they say, you know, you uh, combat or, or conflict is a living thing. It's, you cannot plan your way out of it. You have to, you have to come from your heart and you have to adapt to what you are seeing in the moment. And, you know, as Mike Tyson would say, everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the mouth yeah. and yeah. that's how it works. So uh, not to say that, you know, you can't have plans, but to not experience training in such a way that you have no plan. And this is why I like bridging into Giawazas and um, yep. Randori's and that, and that escalation into the free form uh, as, part of, as part of training, even with newer students. Um, it's not that complicated to get them into, all right, let go of the agenda and the plan and the kata and the form to try to work this into a live, a live thing. And I think our last discussion, we talked about playing as a part of, of bringing that out, you know? Uh, yeah. We, what, what, do you, what do you talk about? Playing? I, I think the dojo Aikido martial arts is a microcosm of, of life. It is. Right? Everyone had big plans and COVID hit. What happened to your plans then? <laughs> right. But, you know, we, we have plans are great. Mm -hmm. But they have to be adapted as well. And, and um, if, if you cannot adapt, you're dead. Exactly. Yep. And I, the fun I, part I, uh, is, is training in, into that adaption, you know, and, mm -hmm. and not throwing so much into, into somebody's environment that they can't navigate it, but to start to learn to navigate more and more challenging uh, situations is very nourishing. And i uh, Talk about adapting. Mm -hmm. Worked with um, one of my students, and he, he probably had anger management issues. We're working on the Dover nightclub, mm -hmm. someone grabbed him. He went to do Nikajo or Nikyo, as you'd call it. It was about there. And you know, you get to a point, you grab someone's hand, and you think, this ain't working. This is not right. going to work. Yep. So he got it to about there, and he headbutted the Nikajo. Okay. He dropped the guy. Oh, I bet. Yep. Yeah. 
and and that's improvising. He, you know, he could have done the the key horn one, put it on your chest, or but he was was a fluid situation. He went here and bang, mm -hmm. that was it. Sure. And another time, uh, I wasn't working, but apparently there was an altercation, and he came flying. He launched his body. He did what we call an iumiski, or in Tamiki Aikido, it's called uh, shomenate. Shomenate, yeah. He launched his body and put the guy's head through the wall. Oh, yeah. But he put his whole body. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> it wasn't basic. But he adapted. He used the principles, and he, he was there to talk about it afterwards. Got the job done. That's it. Yeah. Um, but, but you can't teach that, can you? Well, that that's the thing, you know. I, and I, as I look at the idea of, okay, you're training the physical part to get used to moving bodies, eyeing up range, dealing with angles, the, the physical realm. Then there's the mental part that is the, I think the glue that holds all of that together that makes those like the adaption you just talked about possible because your brain is not stuck in that physical realm thinking I have to follow the formula that I've done. Really what I'm doing is letting my body do what it has felt doing many, many times in training. I know the, the anatomy of my attacker. I know my anatomy. I know my balance. I know the movement. Uh, and then you can, like the musician, you can improv. You're not stuck playing, you know, a pre-made or pre-written song. You're now writing your own song as you go along. Um, I, that I, mindset gonna, part. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to probably bastardize or, or maybe just attribute this to Einstein without any, you know, uh, <laughs> but I think he said um, creativity over intelligence anytime. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think it's the same. Uh, techniques great, but creativity is so important. It, it really and is. You don't, you don't have to uh, be a fighter. You don't have to be a street brawler to have an imagination of how the techniques can flow. Sure. Whether it's in Jiwaza, whether it's uh, playing around in real life situations, that creativity is what takes you to the next level. Absolutely. You know, in fact, uh, you know, many athletes will talk about being in that flow state, whether they're playing tennis or they're, you know, with, with whatever activity that they're doing, they just get to that. My body's flowing. I'm not thinking about it. I don't have an agenda. You know, I have kind of thoughts, but my body's moving smoothly. Uh, it's working with the mind. Um, I think that that's very crucial. And I think you're right. That, that creativity is part of what brings that excellence out because without that, you're copying somebody else's movement and you're not having that creativity. And I wonder if the, the way that the Japanese often look at authority in is, is almost contra, uh, counterproductive to instilling creativity in students when they pursue being doing what they are told by their instructor over searching what feels right inside of them. You know what I mean? Yep. <clears throat> I, I don't think it's Japanese per se. Mm -hmm. I think it's any uh, a, anyone who's stuck into those the, the realms of like, this is what's right. And this is what I was taught. And this is what has to be passed down. That is um, true. That is, that is a good point. Th there is a core mm -hmm. and long story. Um, I went through a stage years ago where I couldn't lift my arm past there. And this was a, a, in the nineties where I was doing a lot of demonstrations Mm -hmm. probably 30, 40 a year because mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to promote Aikido in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so I would do demonstrations at kickboxing tournaments, um, karate tournaments. I had lots of friends and I used to you know, do it all the time. You asked me and I'd do a demo. And all the UKs were a lot bigger than me. And I would do this technique where I would launch myself and uh, do iriminage without raising my hand. I lift my whole body. Sure. Now, whenever I traveled, people would say, oh, teach me that technique, teach me that technique. And I'd say, no, that's bad technique. They go, it looks brilliant. I said, no, it's bad. The only people never asked to be taught that technique were my deshi or my students who before the demonstration would massage my arm and then 
rip on my arm. <laughs> and they knew that that was an improvisation. Sure. And if I could, I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't jump. But because they were tall and they couldn't raise my arm, I jumped. So they knew, okay, that's an improvisation. That's not the call. But people who don't know the teacher mix up what's the core and what's the peripheral. Sure. And then you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> yeah. You don't understand what to keep and what to what can be changed. And then then ensues all the arguments over, well, is that good technique? Is it not? Would it work? Would it not? I mean, it, it sounds like the same dialogue that that seems to happen regarding t Koichi Tohei and the Tohei hop, because he would do the same thing. Uh, you know, coming over to America and having these tall American ukes, he'd be jumping, you know, and uh, I mean, I can appreciate what him using that that body drop and, and what he did. But it's funny when I see even now, uh, I'll go around, I'll see guys that are over six feet and they're hopping around because they because Tohei did it. Um, like, you don't need what, to, you're what, tall. What about people who have English as their native language? speaking like a Japanese person speaking English because their teacher spoke that way. <laughs> you know, it, to be honest, I have always wondered, there are a number on that same related note, a number of Japanese instructors that have lived in the United States for 25, 30 years, and they still speak with a very thick Japanese accent. And there are very few people that can live in a, in a land they speak perfect English or could, you know, it's always wondered it because, you know, accents are things that you can pick up when you move to a new area and that you can lose as you become more fluent in that native language. Um, but I've always wondered, you know, does this paint kind of an image that people kind of want and expect from a Japanese martial art instructor to sound, you know, have a thick Japanese accent? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't I, answer I, that. I don't know. I, I can't answer that, but can I say that a lot of Japanese instructors who come come out to the West are very insular. Mm -hmm. They move in their own Japanese circles. Mm -hmm. They teach their martial art. They don't they don't work outside of that. Mm -hmm. And so their their language skills don't change. I know many Greeks and Italians who've been in Australia for 30, 40 years, and they still speak with a really, really heavy. Italian or Greek accent, their yeah, English is so limited because mm. they work with other Greeks and Italians. They, you know, sorry, sure. I'm digressing, but it's no, just, that's uh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that could I think, well I think be. They, they can be quite insular, mm -hmm. and maybe also maybe the mindset. I'm not, I'm not changing. I need to preserve. Sure, maybe. Yeah, you know, and it's funny that I had uh, one of my best friends ever uh, from here moved over to Australia, and she came back a few years back, and she had such a a. a, a thick Australian accent that I almost didn't recognize her. <laughs> it was always jarring because she went from like, you know, perfect North American accent, you know, which to me didn't have one because it spoke the same way that I did. And then to come back, you know, as a, as a thick Aussie with the slang and the whole thing, it was, it was. <laughs> can I, can I? Sure. When, when I travel overseas, mm -hmm. when I go to England or when I was in Japan looking for work as an English teacher, people would pick me as an Australian straight away, mm -hmm. right? And say, <clears throat> you're Australian. And I'd say, yep. But in Australia, people ask me where, what kind of accent I have. Mm. <laughs> so I sound different, right? And <clears throat> Like a chameleon. I, I, I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's the same in martial arts because it, when I teach... Other, other martial arts styles, they say, oh, you do Aikido. I said, yep. But when I teach Aikido, people ask me, what other martial arts have you done? Because mm. I tend to mix it a little bit. Sure. And I have a different outlook on, on how to do Aikido and, and how you want to enter. And, and you know, uh, my Aikido is not, not as circular as I'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so pe people, I think it's perspective. Sure. Uh, I, I've done, you know, I've dabbled in other things, but not not long enough to say I've actually done it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just Aikido, and where the what the angles it's taken me off is based on my experiences and my imagination, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I did want to kind of diverted there a little bit, but to kind of bring it back on track, I, one thing I wanted to ask you in this conversation was, as an instructor, having a student come to you who is um, perhaps introverted or um, maybe shy, how do you look to bring that out, bring the inside, uh, I guess, the more assertive part of them out or can, or find it and then let them start to explore it to build their confidence. Uh, it's, I'm finding that's very much a mindset type of a, of a challenge in terms of instructing somebody like that versus somebody who comes in who's got a certain amount of assertiveness and they, they, they kind of understand what they want from the art and they can apply themselves. Um, I find that there's like a spectrum of the types of students that I will, that I will often get. And, you know, a student will be somewhere along that spectrum from very introverted to very extroverted or very uh, passive to very assertive. Um, and I think it can be a little bit more of a challenge to, to bring somebody like that who's very introverted and shy kind of out of their shell. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on an instructor bringing that out? Uh, firstly, I'd say it's different if you run a small dojo with maybe uh, a dozen people mm -hmm. to running a big dojo with uh, maybe 100, 200 people. Sure. If you, if you have that small dojo, then you can give them that one-on-one -on -one attention and, um, and, and, and you know, get into their, their head space and say, okay, you know, this is a problem, let's work on it, et cetera. But when you have a bigger dojo, you, you can't do that. Right. You gotta let them go and very, very, very slowly bring them along. And I think uh, the dojo I run is, is a bigger dojo. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the belt systems and gradings come in. Mm. You encourage them because a lot of people like that don't wanna do a demonstration, don't mm. wanna do a grading. And so rather than say you're introverted or you lack confidence or whatever, you change the goalposts and you say, do this test. It will help you improve your technique, training for the test, and it will help you, you know, you pick something, uh, ukemi. Sure. Work on that ukemi, it'll take you. And achievement lends itself to confidence. And confidence lends itself to achievement. And Definitely. then once they see themselves achieving stuff, you can then say, hey, look how you, you know, look where you've come from and look where you are now. Mm -hmm. So I've had this a female who uh, was lacked a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it took her ages to drum up the 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 guts to come to come onto the mat. She'd, she'd say, I want to train, then she'd cancel, I want to start, I'd cancel, finally did. And after two months of training, three months of training, I put her with a raw beginner mm -hmm. who was really struggling. Uh, and that person, I, I knew she did a trial class, would never come back. And I pulled this one aside afterwards and I said, you know, that's what you were like when you started. Look at how far you've come. So, yeah. I have it as an instructor, I have it in me to change the goalposts. Sure. And my goalpost is never what is obvious. Mm -hmm. So if, if uh, lack of confidence is a problem, then confidence is not the goalpost. It would be something else, something a little more attainable, something a little less intrusive. Mm -hmm. But it's a slow, it's a slower thing. Yeah, it is. It's not one of those things, you know, changing somebody's body takes some time changing their mind takes more time um so but that, there's a reason why in martial arts you know all all the teachers talk about the top teachers they talk about uh your spirituality and and etc cetera, etc cetera. but they don't teach spirituality from the start they teach the body dynamics because the way into someone's mind is through the body yep. and the way to someone's spirit is through the mind right so uh, you, you coach the body and of course you teach uh, physical discipline and, and all the rest of it. But essentially you, you're trying to build a man, but you build a man or person through the body. Right. In fact, this is where I think we get back to the very first 
part of this discussion, which was the shortcut. People want a shortcut to the spirit side and they don't want to spend much time in the physical or maybe just try to jump to the mental and kind of go over it. But I found that there's no shortcut through that. Um, that physical part really uh, sheds a lot of light on the mental part and sometimes not in a good way. I think, I know I've felt this and I've seen other students go through it where you, you know, when you get on the mat, you find flaws in your thinking and in your mindset that, that the physical shines a light on and you have to face it and change it. And it can be uncomfortable sometimes. I've even seen students break down you know, in, yeah. in tears on the mat, because it's, they, they find something deep inside of them that, that they perhaps didn't know was there, or comes out. Um, but then they realize that, that it can be fixed, this can be something that can be, you know, purged out of them or improved in such a way that it's not, it's not a demon for them anymore, to put, could use that term. A friend of mine said, in describing a dojo, he said a dojo should be a safe place where you can be made to feel uncomfortable. That's a great description. And I think that's, that, that's so important. That, that's yeah. when you can push the envelope. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a safe surrounding and we create that, that safety net mm -hmm. and now we can push them. And, and sure, people end up in tears and, and you, know, you feel stuff like that, but it has to be in that, in that safety environment. Right. Yeah, and you know, every I've, what I've found in visiting dojos and, and having trained in many of them over the years is every training group, and whether you call it a dojo or even it's just a group of people out in a park, has a certain atmosphere to it that is a, a summation of of the spirit of spirits of the people that are there, like what their intent is, and I'm I'm sure you've seen this and encountered it where you know you have people that are would rather kind of stand around and talk on the mat than do reps or to you know, explore their technique or, or how they're doing things or break down what they're doing to find what the flaws and try to purge them out. Um, and I found that if there was one thing I was nervous, nervous about opening a dojo, you know, we're just doing our 10 year anniversary now. So it was 10 years ago. Oh, was, congratulations. Thank you. Um, was having, how do I make sure that that is the, I've got the right atmosphere, the, the that constructive, uh, honest, with that draws good people and doesn't have the wrong influences in it because i've seen small influences that are that that will diverge or, or inhibit growth come in and then it starts to grow and it can be it can be stressful on a training group and this i think relates to being able to effectively learn and, and foster growth with students when you have a good atmosphere versus when you have one that's uh, sketchy or perhaps even mildly toxic. Um, those are, are careful things about the training culture of the people that are there. Um, you know, and, and I think it's probably easier with when you have a larger group because there's such a, a mass, as long as it's, it has grown the right way, it's, it, it has a certain amount of inertia going the right direction. But, um, you know, it's always, always when you start a new group, you, I'm always worried about those first few people like if the, that core group of the first few people are solid, then what you have will grow well after that. But boy, if you get only three or four people and one of them's got a weird attitude, that, that can be very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. If, if you have a big group, that weird attitude can hide in the corner. Right. It affect the whole group, but small group. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how do you pick a good dojo? How do you pick a good one? Yeah, that's... I, I would, and I've been asked this many, many times, but the first thing I would advise is say, I wouldn't even worry about what art they're teaching, but go and look at the senior students because that's what that group is building. If, if you get a, a weird feeling from what those senior students are and you don't wanna be like them, then I would just turn around and walk out. That's probably one of my biggest indicators. Let, let, let me put it very plainly. This is um, Saito Sensei said this. Mm -hmm. He said that if you wanna pick a good dojo, one, Make sure the chief, the head instructor can make the technique work. Mm -hmm. Two, that the seniors are looking after the juniors. Yep, that's good advice. That, that's really succinct and bang. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and that from there would emanate the atmosphere you're talking about. Mm -hmm. where, where 
you're looked after, but you're also coached, uh, you know, right. and, and you're also learning technique that's at least one person can make it work. It's not airy fairy. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, and I think you hit on the right word there too, the coaching part. And, and I think I've seen larger dojos that, that have like senior students that are assigned to be like, take the coaching role with junior students because the head, the head instructor or the instructors, there's just too many students. They can't do it with all of them, but to see that the job is being done of having somebody that can have a personal mentor relationship with students, I, th I think is very important. Um, and any large class that, that any class at all that doesn't have that, I think is going to have, going to have trouble conveying that excellence to, to the students, unless there's a student that is extraordinary in, in his will or her will to excel and will push through that, uh, I guess, inattentiveness uh, so on behalf of, by the teachers. Is this a flaw we have in martial arts? Um, you go to university and, and everything's set up. It's been thought of, the, the curriculum set up over years and years and years. You go to a dojo and we follow someone who is gifted. We follow a natural. You know, talk, think of all the great teachers, doesn't matter what martial arts, they're all naturals. And, you know, uh, in, in the words of John Lennon, if you gave them a tuba, they'd squeeze out a, a tune. Right. They, they're artists, they're naturals. And, and here we are, people with two left legs and no right, trying to follow a natural. Shouldn't we follow someone who is totally hopeless, but went through the system? and got good through the system. Now that's sure. a perfect system. Yeah. But instead we, we copy naturals. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. In fact, I think, you know, we're at a time now where we, we see exactly that. We have Shihans that went through the system and they did not connect with what the natural, you know, maybe a generation or a couple of generations ago had, but they, you know, did the Xerox copy of the Xerox copy of the Xerox copy. Yeah and could go through the motions. And, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed to say that, that, you know, I've run across some of these people that even though they've got the rank and the, the prestige and all that other stuff, they don't have the actual talent to go with it. Um, you know, and I think it's a lot of it's political, it's, it's, but you're being too polite. It's the <laughs> I'm being very diplomatic. <laughs> it, it, it's just, I, I don't see anything in those moves. I don't even see them understanding those moves. Right. It's become right. so robotic. It, it, mm -hmm. Or in, in some schools of Aikido, I'm not mentioning names, it's become so robotic. And in other schools, it becomes so airy-fairy. Mm -hmm. It loses all, all meaning. Yeah, I, I agree with you. In fact, I'm, I'm concerned that what Aikido is evolving into is essentially... Uh, like what the tea ceremony has evolved into, which is a ritual, a ceremonial ritual, uh, primarily with, you know, in terms of the tea ceremony, it's not about how the tea tastes. It's about totally something else. And, you know, there may have been a number of Japanese arts that have done that same evolution. And I'm curious if, you know, where, where Aikido would be in 20 years, I suppose this is a whole nother, whole nother episode discussion we yeah. could get into in this one, but but I think this is what happens when the, that beacon of how do we transfer excellence from a skilled practitioner to the next generation or to the students, because they're going to be the instructors coming up next. Like that's, that to me is that the, the anchor that keeps the drift from happening off into the ritual ceremony or the, you know, whatever other thing a martial art evolves into. This, this is, I think we're having a connection hiccup here. This is what happened. Yeah, sorry, you've cut out. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, I cut out just one of us cut out just a little bit. Go ahead and start again. Okay, so yeah, yeah, you, you froze. So maybe I froze. I don't sure. Um, should we start again? Uh, yep, go right ahead. Okay, so I think this is where the process becomes more important than the objective where the form outweighs the substance. And, and I've always been taught substance over form. Mm -hmm. 
form form will take you there, but it has to be understood to have substance. Sure. Both uh, both in a technical physical aspect and in also a spiritual or I'm I'm not spiritual but in more in a let's say emotional mm -hmm. level. If if you want to throw a punch, well, a back fist, well, that's fine. But if you put your body, your soul into it, then it takes on a whole new dimension. The mm -hmm. form still has to be there, but the substance, it's no longer just like this. The substance gives it the oomph. Sure. Um, so I think I think in, in Japan, there's the... You know, there's, there's no street fighting, there's no violence. So why should they really want to practice against mm -hmm. for self-defense? It's not necessary for them, which is fine for them. For us, people still want to learn how to defend themselves. Having said that, if you ask a room of people, how many of you had been in an altercation in the last five years, hardly any hands would go up. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people have you known been attacked with a knife only a couple, yeah, yeah, Not many. You know, I, I've had three knives and a gun pulled on me over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, but how many people would understand that? Uh, yeah. Not many. And and but they still want to practice for that. Sure. And I think that in practicing for that, it gives you the confidence. Mm -hmm. The ground and to tell someone to f off. Um, the, the training gives you the confidence, and in my experience, confidence is 80% of technique. I would have to both, agree with that one. Both on the mat and in reality. Mm -hmm. You know, and this was an interesting uh, question that we uh, had on the last episode with Tony Blauer about if you are not confident in your physical abilities, how well will you be able to negotiate your way out of something when you know that you don't have anything to fall back on it's kind of like being in a poker hand where you have to bluff because you've only got a two three a seven and a nine and yep. you know but if you're confident because you're holding four aces you can play differently and and i think i personally think that's important um not to say that that being a martial artist means you're just going to go around you know beating on people or anything like that or getting into fights but I find it's easier to negotiate from a position of confidence and strength than from a position of weakness and fear. Um, it's very, very hard to rein in that fear when you're in a, in a high stress situation and not have people read it from you. Can I, can I use your analogy? Oh, please. I've bluffed when I've had four aces. <laughs> and I've also bluffed when I've had nothing. Right. But having had the experience of having four aces, I had, I don't know if the experience, the bravado, the desperation, when I stood my ground and just said, no. You know, to, to guys who are bigger than me, two or three of them wanting to come into a club and me saying, standing by myself saying, looking up and saying, no, you're not getting in. It was a bluff. I had nothing. <laughs> right? But, but the experience and the determination to hold your ground, I, I think comes from, you know, being thrown on your head a few times and having to stand up and still face your teacher. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's a valuable uh, experience. Go ahead. I think you just flipped out for a second there. Flip out again. Okay. So, Chitin, we can't uh, talk about this without talking about Shuhari. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Are you okay if we go down that route? Absolutely. That's a great topic. Very relevant. So, and I, I need to uh, complete the, the circle. So when we were talking about creativity, you said we put into perspective the way I see it. So mm -hmm. um, in if I freeze, just put up your hand. Um, yeah. th there's different connotations on Shu Hari, right? So mm -hmm. in Shu, you, you're learning. And the best way to learn is to copy. Mm -hmm. uh, and in heart, you're starting to understand or master the technique. And in re, 
course, you forget the technique and, and you start to flow and you do essentially what, what we see all the grandmasters do, right? The, the issue is people think they're separate stages. They're not. They can coexist in the one person in the same class. Mm -hmm. I can do jiwaza and think, oh, Jesus, that was rubbish, and go back to the basic and think, that's where I was wrong. Look at the basic, bang, that's where I was wrong. Take it back to the, the middle stage of understanding it, and then try and use it in, in a free format. So it, it coexists. It's not three years in shoe, five years in ha, and then you're in re. Don't, don't work like that. It, 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 it evolves. And it's that, what would be the, the connection between the three? Sure. So I, it, I like the way you describe that because I think a lot of people view of the, well, I, I want to, I want to strive to get to that re. I want to climb that ladder, and then once like I'm now enlightened, I am beyond form, and yeah. and yeah. they view it like an achievement. And, it, and you, the way you describe it just shatters that that illusion because I think it is an illusion. You don't ever get to the of that point of enlightenment. And I've known some very very talented, extraordinary martial artists. And not one of them would ever say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enlightened. I've got everything. They're all exactly. back to that. All right, I'm going to go back to the beginner. I'm going to go back to studying, understanding. They really go through all of them. Well, there's a, there's a Zen proverb that says, if you reach enlightenment tomorrow, what then? <laughs> right. So, uh, and you're right. Uh, you know, the, the people who, who are enlightened will never profess to be enlightened because they always think, there's more. There's more to be done. Mm -hmm. I'm not there yet. Yeah. And and even if I think if you reach the pinnacle, you may not go any higher, but you change. Mm. You evolve. And you might stay on that same plateau, but you evolve. Um, sure. But going back to, there has to be a constant in Shu Hari. Mm -hmm. In Yoshinkan Aikido, if you ask people, that constant would be the Kamai. Mm -hmm. And your, your kamai should change in different stages. The, the way you express yourself, the way you take kamai. Uh, for me, it's not kamai, but it's the self. Mm. Uh, whether I, whichever stage I'm in, it's the self. And what keeps the self on that straight line is the objective on the end. Okay. Which, you know, might be uh, for some people, might be an inspiration they're chasing or an image mm -hmm. they're chasing or, or they want to be like their teacher, whatever it is. But that's the objective. And then you have to have a constant. Otherwise, you, you, you spiral out of, you know, and then start doing Californian Aikido. No <laughs> offense to Californians, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that make sense? Go ahead. What's, I think it, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. And I, I, I do like how just, and I'm going to look at this the way that, uh, you know, when I go from my own examination of my understanding part, when that shifts into improvisation, and then I go, well, no, I'm way off the form. Now I need to go back and look at the form part and how that fits with my understanding. Um, that, this has been a real uh, a gem from this conversation that it's, I'm going to be processing on this for, for a while, because I think it's a better, more productive way to look at it, um, especially as we, we examine our own progress and because, you know, we're always going to be our best and worst critic um, yep. and, and, and should and be. Rightly so too. And rightly yeah. so too. Yeah. I, 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 I've lived in different ways. In, sometimes I had an image of a teacher doing a technique mm -hmm. and I chased that image. Yep, I have to. I want to have, I, and or, or sometimes the teacher's done something to me, and I think, wow, and I've tried to find that feeling. And occasionally, UK goes, that's what it felt like. And go, yep, and mm. then I can't do it again. <laughs> but you know, um, sure. it, it sometimes we need we need a goal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Without that goal, yeah. I so, remember one of those. Uh, I had a very much of a love hate relationship, more hate than love for Shionage when I first started because I was taller than everybody in my practice group. 
by about at least four inches, if not six or more. And I just thought, boy, I'm never going to be able to get to do this. And I, I think I was around Purple Belt and I got to see this Sandan test by a guy that was about an inch taller than I was. And he had an Uke who was, I think, about five, eight, five, nine. And he did the smoothest, nicest Shionage underneath the shoulder. And just seeing that, like, just kicked the door open. I said, all right, now I'm going to go back and I'm, he could do it. It can be done. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Like, just like you said, like I had this, he showed me this thing and then I tried to go through the form part and, and sort of copy what he did. And I, I don't think I do it the way that he does it, but I really got to like Shihonage when I hated it before, just from that one thing happening. Um, and so that was, that was, a, a, I think a good example of what you're talking about, of taking that possibility and exploring it. Yep, exactly. Now, how did you how did you do that? Uh, <laughs> I tried. To, I had a bit of a video in my mind of seeing him sink and how he did it. Of course, he had Hakim on, so it's hard for me to see his, what his legs were doing. But I got a feel for where his body moved, and I just tried to go to that same place. Um, but you had to play around with it, right? Oh yeah, I had to tinker with it, and in it, yeah, absolutely. And, and when 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 do you play around with it? In class or after class? Um. Sometimes it was in class. For, I mean, I, I tried to make it work for me whenever we would study Shionage. Uh, sometimes I would actually seek out some of the shorter ukes because I'm like, the more challenging they are, the more challenging, challenging it is for me to make it work. And so... so the way I'm getting at is in, in my dojo, because the Yoshinkan system is so strict, if we say you turn 135 degrees, that's what you do. Not mm -hmm. 136, not 134, 135. Bang. So it doesn't matter if you're doing it against someone short like me or tall like you, mm -hmm. you would do the same thing. Sure. But when do you make it your own? When do you adapt and change? After the class. Right. Mm -hmm. Hence, the creativity comes in and also the thing of being the last person on the mat. Mm -hmm. That's where you make it your own. Sure. You make it your own where you do when you do jiwaza, when you do self-defense techniques, whatever. And people don't understand what jiwaza is about. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, okay, fine, it's dealing with um, momentum, it's dealing with energy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you're getting to do your own thing. But it's more than that. It's learning to deal with the space between you and your partner. Mm -hmm. If you can control that space, you're controlling your partner's weapon. Mm -hmm. And in, in Jiwaza, as UK, right? If you have to run after the shte or the nage, can you kick? Not very easily. <laughs> no, very, very few people. You know, there, there's there's uh, some people who do seido karate who, who specialize in doing taisubaki and kicking at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we've tried it. It's really hard to kick while you're running. It so is. I've negated your legs. Mm -hmm. If I move in, I've also negated your legs. The right timing. Right. Uh, if I stay that's my favorite you. approach because kickers do not like people entering in on them. Yeah, and and it's controlling that distance, mm -hmm. and then making the techniques your own, uh, playing around with it, and that play time is so important. It is. But it has to be done after the class. Sure. And the creativity helps you as well. Mm -hmm. Another thing that half the, not half, I think 90% of the, the techniques we do in Jiwaza don't work. Mm -hmm. Will never work. But you're not learning that. You're learning the technique in the Kihon. What you're learning in Jiwaza is movement. Right. You're studying movement. So the technique can be totally hopeless, but you're learning to move. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to people saying Aikido doesn't work, it's because I stand there and I say, okay, throw a punch. I ain't going to stand there. Right. You shape up. What am I, an idiot? I'm going to wait for you to, to throw a punch. You uh, yeah, you're breaking up, up a little bit. Something. Either I'm out of there. <laughs> okay. All right. Could be Australia. Could be Australia. It's, it's raining now. so. It's, oh, is it? Bad. Okay. Yeah. Not joking, but yeah, uh, look, um, we have to be, I think, true to ourselves, 
-hmm. So, you know, Shiora Gozo said, uh, Aikido is a martial art and it all should be remembered and practiced as a martial art. Even though you never use it in your life, if you don't practice the martial art, you lose all essence of it. Sure. And I think that's what keeps us true. So yes, we can try this, we can try that, but in essence, in especially in what you talked about, the atmosphere, in our attitude, we need to remember it's a budo. And, and this is my fear of Aikido. It's like, it's not big. It stopped being a Budo in lots of places. And I, I think it has. In fact, what you mentioned a moment ago, I think strikes on that. And that is using that movement to control the range, control the angle and the orientation to your attacker. That's a very assertive mindset. That's not a passive reactive one. And, and I think once you have you would start to instill the importance of that mindset. Now you can see how this parallels into any kind of strategy, whether it's business negotiations or uh, any application of strategy is, is you are actively changing your relationship to the other person. You protect yourself, you maneuver to a better position so that you can apply control if need be. Um, all of those things come from that movement part. And that's why I liked how you described that of controlling and not because you're just running somebody over, but you are making sure that the angle, the range is all what you want it to be, not what your attacker wants it to be or the other person. So I, I move because I, I'm, I'm 58 kilos. I cannot take a hit. <laughs> and if you're going to hit me in my head, the, the hardest part, if you hit me, in my chest or in my, in my gut, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done. It's my strength. Uh, let me ask you a simple question. You can delete this if you want. So uh, when, when do you, like, okay, if I pull, you enter, yes? Right, yeah. Yes. So I'm sorry, breaking up just a little bit there, so I don't know if you me? got my answer. But yes. So, all right. So when when I pull, you enter. You mm -hmm. don't hit me. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. When I push, you do a thing. Mm -hmm. You turn. In Yoshinkan system, it's called Ichani. So I pull, you enter. I push, you turn. If I'm striking you, when do you enter and when do you turn? If I'm sorry, you broke up there. If you were what? If I'm striking, when would you enter and when would you turn? I would as soon as possible. Hopefully, as you're loading your your strike is when I would enter. Okay, and if the strike comes in, then I turn. Okay. Or then I shift off the line. Either way. Very good. So I would say, if you're faster than me, I would turn. Mm -hmm. If I'm faster than you, I would enter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So before before you you land your weight forward. Mm -hmm. I would enter. If your sure. weight's landed, I turn. Mm -hmm. Where do you get that experience from? From Jewels. And the, the sad part is, I've asked instructors, Japanese instructors, you know, a lot of other people, when, you know, someone pulls you, enter, someone pushes you, turn, when would you enter a turn? What would, when would you use which one if I was throwing a punch? And I've been said, if you throw a hard punch, I turn, and you should throw a gentle punch, they'd enter. And I, I've thought, no one's ever thrown a gentle punch at me. <laughs> right, they're doing you a favor. <laughs> Who would do Who that? Who throws a gentle punch? No, yeah. You know, that's because these people have no activity to think past pull or push. Sure. Yeah. And, and you, 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 and and that's why. I'm taking it back to that creativity and mm -hmm. understanding the, the, the hard part of understanding the technique, understanding the basics. That's so important. Sure. And, and most people don't get past the shoe. They think they do, but they don't. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that, and I'm glad you described that because it, it brings to mind a, a variation of, of Giawaza that I've tried to instill, instill that mindset of controlling the range. 
uh because the a lot of the jiwazas that i was taught was often you'd have a student say in the middle of a group uh, surrounded and they would stand there and they would offer a hand or okay would come into attack they would do a technique they turn and another one would attack and they kind of do it one at a time and the way that i changed it up to to answer that question of when would you do that is as uke approaches you approach uke because now instead of being a static target you're changing the, your attackers or uke's targeting computer you're messing with it you're you're adjusting that range and you're going to close it before they get that attack formed or you're going to start messing with that and just changing geowaza in that one respect which is to have nage in the middle of the circle actively go to the next uke whichever the next uke they choose changes the whole feel of geowaza and in what i think is a very good way so so now you're setting the parameters they're reacting to you rather than you reacting to them right mm -hmm. and and this is this is a tactic we use in in every day like you know absolutely there's a group of guys standing on the street corner mm -hmm. you cross the road and stay away from them i go up to them i go hey guys what's the time mm -hmm. Now they're right. reacting to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Perfect example of the, the use of strategy. It's brilliant. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just showing you, hey, I'm not afraid of you. Mm -hmm. I might be, but I, I know if I put my head down and walk past you, you're going to pick on me. So I just go, guys, can you tell me the way here or there or what's the time? And now they, they're going, oh, they're reacting to me now. Right. And so it, it's the same. And, and this is the creativity I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But also, yeah, that's a great description. And, and, you know, why, why do we do mas a martial art if you can't take it out of the dojo? Seriously. Right. Right. And that's so important. That's, yeah. And, exactly. and it's the same in, in corporate talks. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And it's the same in teaching. Uh, you what know, we talked about earlier, I can respond to an introverted student mm -hmm. or I can get that student to respond to me. Sure. And then I can lead that student. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's the, the tech, the, the, the philosophies are the same, that the tactics change. Sure. Uh, yeah, the physical part can change. It's the fundamental strategy that's the same. You know, years ago, I had a student of mine and we got to talking about he was going to apply for a job and very much an introverted type person. And, and uh, he was struggling with some of his job interviews. And uh, I said, well, how do you normally approach him? And he, he would describe it. And I would sum it up to say that he went in kind of afraid, sort of his hat in his hand, but like, I'll answer whatever questions you want me to answer. And I said, well, in your next job interview, give this a try. Go in with the idea of like, you're interviewing them. Like, what about this company would make you make me want to work for you? And ask some questions within the interview. Don't be a jerk about it, but go in with that. I'm here to see if this company is a cool place or if it's got people that I would like to work with. And just changing your mindset changed the whole atmosphere of his job interview. And he, and he came back from it and said, oh, that went really well. And, and the idea that he actually asked questions of the interviewer showed that he was engaged and, and had his mind on possibly working for the company and, and how he could do it well and that he he showed a whole different side of himself and and uh i think like that shows the exact same strategy you are taking initiative into that space let, let me run something by you okay so sure. you've done multiple attackers gwas and stuff like that yes yeah so the let's say you're facing off what do you see see three fingers up three fingers okay anything else uh two fingers down or the thumb is thumb is down and okay but they're all facing so, me i would i would say then people most people would say that mm -hmm. and i would i was thought that as well and then i respond to them as they attack me mm -hmm. now i see space person space person space person sure so i don't have to go to them i can go to a space and make them come to me right Okay. Now who's controlling the the dynamics and the timing and everything else? Me. Mm -hmm. Rather than me reacting to them, they are now reacting to me. Sure. So uh, and and that changes the whole dynamic. It does. 
you know, one of the, one of the, the geowazes that I do is, is have somebody in the center of a circle and I have the, the ukes walk in a circle. And it, when I say go, Nage has got to get out of that circle. And I think that it strikes on that, that space thing that you're talking about. And what I found in doing this drill was even if you have like say six people in a circle, there's some pretty big gaps. And so what Nage's tend to do is they spot that gap and they try to run through it. And as soon as that happens, usually they get crunched in because Ukes can close that distance very, very quickly. And it creates a feel. And that is when you're running through the graph, if you're one of these two Ukes, you don't feel any pressure from Nage trying to race between the Uke that's next to you. But when Nage actually comes at one of the Ukes, now that Uke starts to hesitate. And then you basically go around them. And so it's, I like playing around with the, that mindset of, of actually turning Nage into the attacker and going after to try to change that mindset of, the, of that Uke. Because if Nage views himself kind of as a rabbit that's trying to evade the wolves, the wolves get more confident. And so I've tried to uh, combine the, the mindset of you're going to actually be the wolf and the Ukes are the rabbits. Um, and that actually works quite well. Did we have a little hiccup again there too? Uh, there's a video. Uh, it's called in, uh, in, in, in Search of Greatness. In Search of, in search of Greatness. Okay. I want to write that down. Um, and and they, they talk to Jerry Rice. Right. Uh, Wayne Gretzky. Mm -hmm. Pele. A few sports psychologists. And mm -hmm. everyone talks about the playtime. Sure. The unstructured playtime. This mm -hmm. is where you make it your own. And there's no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's like what you said. It's in trying. It's in doing. Mm -hmm. and and not looking for those some sometimes the best techniques are the most ineffective because they are there to teach you something right uh, and and some so we, we throw the baby out of the bathwater because we say tension nugget gets rubbish it doesn't work etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. but it's there and it's been there for so many years because yeah. there's something to be learned from it mm -hmm. and then I think it's in that playtime, in it's in that exploring bit that makes us who we are. Right. It doesn't make us all the same. Exactly. And, and being able to spot it, the right technique for that circumstance and, and apply it. To me, that's the glue. And if if it was the system that was the be all and end all, if it was the system that uh, made the person, mm -hmm. then there'd be so many uh top people in any system but there's mm -hmm. not it's what those top people gleaned from the system and made it their own sure absolutely and when you make it your own in yeah. the playtime in the juwaza mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons that that i think those who criticize other martial arts need to absorb and understand that's really not the art it's that it's the artist and that every martial art has got some extraordinary practitioners in it that can do amazing things and i think so yeah. yeah but also i think we need to get to the re part mm -hmm. where we forget not just the technique but we forget our egos and if someone says hey that's crap that's rubbish you go hey that's okay sure. that's fine i'm yeah. not going to stand there and argue with you i'm not going to uh, prove the efficacy of aikido i'm going to say hey you don't believe it? Cool. And you have good reason too, as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. See you later. Sure. Don't waste your time with the, you know. So uh, the, the, the problem is a lot of us haven't gone through that re part where we forget ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think maybe I'm getting older. I'm starting to maybe appreciate it a little bit. My ego is still too big for that. Sure. You know, and I guess we're, we've been going for quite a while with this chat. I've been loving it. Um, where I related even myself is when I, in, in wanting to absorb and make things my own, I go, like you said earlier, right back to that 
to that shoot. Like I want to absorb show, you know, when I get together with other martial artists, like show me your favorite stuff, show me your bread and butter, the things that, that just work smooth for you. I want to absorb it. So it is that, that cycle, that circle. It's not that anybody lives on, on a high level on that, uh, you know, enlightened plane. It's to me, it's, you always go back to that, show me the, the, the thing so I can copy it and I can go through that, that shoe and then start to understand it and then start to own it. I love that cycle. Like as a learning cycle, that is such a, a nourishing thing for the soul. I, I, I think the, the secret to learning is to, and then we cut out again. Oh yeah. You cut out again. Start again. The secret to learning. Sorry. Sorry. That's all right. The, the secret to learning is to enjoy learning. Absolutely. Yep. A, a musician once said, uh, the way to get good at music is to enjoy the boring bits. That's true. That's very true because it takes a lot of time. So yeah. you better yeah. enjoy it. If you're not, what are you doing it for? Exactly. Yeah. I, I never enjoyed the, the basics growing up. I was always too impatient. Sure. Yeah. Like we've all been gone through that. Dragon Sensei once tried to teach me EI as a kid, and I was just like, he said, that's not for you. Don't do it. <laughs> so, uh, but we cut out again, I think. Yep. Yeah, we're getting some connection issues. Yeah. but yeah. Um, So, you know, I, I think the right time, the right place, the right person, everything has to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And in, in learning, that affinity to the teacher is so important. Definitely. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's really, if you want to learn something, you have to understand where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. As the teacher said to me, it, you have to know who your parents are. Mm. And, and what he meant was, if you know why your teacher is teaching it in a certain way, then you know what to keep and what to change. Right. But if you don't know your teacher, then you don't know why he thought in that way. Just like my story with the arm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then you change the wrong things or you, you, you take things wrongly. And then, you know, learning becomes a lot more convoluted. But sure. if you understand your teacher, then you start to know what to do, what to change, what to keep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, very cool. Uh, this has been a great chat. I, I know we got kind of, not even kind of, we got way deep into, uh, into some esoteric uh, stuff on the teaching part. Uh, but I think this is something that every instructor, even every student who is, who winds up mentoring somebody sh should think about, um, you know, there's definitely some good enlightening stuff here. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you being on the show. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You bet. Um, Take care and uh, hope you're doing well yeah. down there in Australia. Thank you. Always a pleasure talking to you. Cheers. Yeah, you too. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.